Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 So we have uh, we have today uh, the renowned speaker Dr. Baburaj uh, with us, and he will be speaking on the patient uh, positioning. And uh, in the PG corner, we have PGs from Lourdes Hospital at Nankulam, and uh, Dr. Uh, Shobha Philip will be moderating the session, and uh, uh, the PGs uh, and C Rajan. will be speaking on phenylephrine and uh, dr parvathy on double lumen tube uh, over to you uh, president uh, dr shamsa begum for the official welcome uh, respected national president dr vengidagiri uh, our state secretary dr paul or rafael our academic coordinators vijesh and uh, rajesh and uh, binel will be joining soon and uh, all senior is leaders team members and your pgs today uh, in our 13th academic program uh, we have uh, the speaker uh, the main speaker as uh, dr babraj he doesn't require any introduction to kerala as well as to uh, all our um, national uh, level um, cmes as well as the conferences and he is a very good teacher and at the same time he is a very good speaker and he is a familiar person to all of us as well as to the pgs and uh, i um, and more than that i am really happy that he will be joining soon at uh, kerala at the trishur as the president as the hod and the professor oh, on my yeah, in, uh, yeah right. as i have left the place badhiya uh, badhiya babraj i welcome you to this wow. academic program on behalf of all and the next next we will have the uh, pg uh, corner for the pg corner yeah oh yeah Uh, the, today the pgs from the um, lourdes hospital and uh, the dr nc rajan as well as dr parvathy anandu and they will be speaking on phenylephrin and wm2 and dr shobha philip will be uh, um, the chairperson for that and i welcome all other uh, is members as well as the faculty members to this program and i uh, welcome all others to this program now i invite dr bengidagiri for the official inauguration giri thank you, thank, thank you okay. president uh, uh, good evening uh, from madurai i am in madurai attending the tamil nadu state conference uh, and uh, happy to participate uh, in this uh, 13th uh, Uh, program of IAS Kerala. Happy that uh, Dr. Babraj is being invited. It's always always lovable to hear uh, Babraj. He will make anybody to understand uh, the thing, the way in which he speaks and makes people understand. It is lovable to hear his talk. And thirteenth uh, is not a bad number. It's a good number for anybody to learn that this time with the Babraj and the PGs with the final effort and double lumen too. And I wish all the best and uh, happy note that he is coming nearer to our place also because he was so far in Trivandrum and Idikke now he is nearer. Trishur is near to my place also, Kasar Gore than Trivandrum. And uh, people of Trishur Medical College are lucky to have him as somebody there. Uh, thank you and uh, over to you, President. And me, I request uh, uh, Paul, please mute everybody and uh, make only faculties co-host. Uh, uh, Lot of disturbances because somebody has written also. There okay. are a lot of disturbances coming. Please. Okay. Doctor Vijish. Vijish was driving a big car. I saw the car terrace only, not him. He was driving. Okay. It seems to be so uh, not, can start. not online. Uh, uh, we can straight away call the speaker. Uh, Dr. Babraj, please, you can start. He'll be speaking on the patient po uh, positioning. Officially, to introduce Babraj, I think uh, 
uh, he doesn't require introduction. Samsad Madam has already told, you can tell that uh, it, as Vijish is not there, you can, uh, those who don't know him, uh, otherwise we all know him. Uh, huh? Shall I introduce him once more? No, I will, I will read. Uh, okay, data. you read. He's uh, uh, presently working at uh, Government Medical College as a professor of anesthesiology and also the Department of Emergency Medicine. He passed his DA in 1992 with the gold medal and DNB in 1997. He joined Medical College Service in 1996. He has worked at Calicut, Kotem, Alapura, Idiki, Kollam, and Manjeri. He's a life member of ISA, IMA, Indian Association of Palliative Care, Indian Society of Critical Care, qualified and experienced in palliative medicine. Over to you, sir. Dr. Babraj, you can uh, unmute and speak. Dr. Baburaj? Can you share, Baburaj? Okay, uh, I will go uh, to this recording. Is the network is poor uh, at this place? Just hold on a minute. Positioning is a table, and moreover, every position is associated with significant physiological changes. During the next 30 minutes, we'll try to find out answers to these three questions. What is it? Why is it important? And how is it done? What is it? Patient positioning is done for better access to Positions are different for different surgeons. Yes. And commerce one may be supine, others are prone, lateral, sitting, and hypertension. Why are we concerned about this? We are concerned about positioning.
There is a sorry, sorry for the interruption, and uh, there is a, some issue with the, the audio. So we'll do one thing. We'll start with the PG session. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Shobha Philip uh, to be the moderator and uh, start the session. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, madam. Yeah. So. Good evening, everybody. Today's PG corner will be done by Dr. Ansi Rajan. She will be speaking on phenylephrine. And the second session is on double lumen tubes by Dr. Parvati Anandu. So over to you, Dr. Ansi. Can you okay. screen share? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, you are audible. Uh, yes, and you continue. Audible. audible. Good evening, teachers and dear friends. Now I'm going to present about the drug phenylephrine hydrochloride. It is a direct acting sympathomimetic vasoconstrictor amine with potent alpha 1 agonist action. Sympathomimetic or adrenergic drugs are compounds which mimics or enhance the action of catecholamines, that is, adrenaline, noradrenaline, or dopamine. Its major effect is due to direct action on alpha-1 receptor and minor effect due to release of noradrenaline. It is an indirect effect. It is a pure vasoconstrictor with no ionotropic effect because it has no effect on beta receptors. It causes rapid rise in SVR, systemic vascular resistance, and blood pressure. And also reflex reduction in heart rate due to baroreflex mediated response. Coming to the classification of adrenergic agonists, adrenergic agonists are classified into direct acting, indirect acting, and mixed acting drugs. Phenylephrine is a selective direct acting alpha-1 agonist drug. Coming to the basic physiology, the vasopressors, for example, phenylephrine, increases the mean arterial pressure by increasing the systemic vascular resistance. It stimulates a smooth muscle contraction of the capillaries and arteries, which leads to vasoconstriction and rise in mean, mean blood pressure, which improves the tissue perfusion and oxygenation. In contrast, the ionotropic drugs increase the mean arterial pressure by increasing cardiac output by increasing the contractility. It increases the force of contraction of myocardial muscle and causes rise in mean arterial pressure. Coming to the chemical structure, phenylephrine hydrochloride is a member of class phenylethanolamines and it is a synthetic non-catecholamine. Chemical name is 3-hydroxy-phenyl-ethyl-amine hydrochloride. Chemical formula c 9 h 13 no 2 It differs from adrenaline only in lacking a 4-hydroxyl group on benzene ring. And molecular weight is 167.2. Coming to the preparation, it is commonly available as clear colorless solution in 1 ml, 1 ml ampule containing 10 milligram phenylephrine per ml. It is also available in vials in concentration of 10 milligram per ml. Coming to the dil dilution of phenylephrine, for bolus intravenous administration, prepare a solution containing a final concentration of 100 microgram per ml of phenylephrine for adults and further dilution to 10 microgram per ml for pediatric cases. For this, we have to withdraw 10 milligram, that is 1 ml of 10 mg per ml ampule of phenylephrine hydrochloride and dilute it with 99 ml of 5% dextrose or 0.9% sodium chloride solution. For continuous infusion, prepare solution containing 20 microgram per ml by diluting 10 milligram phenylephrine hydrochloride with 500 ml of 5% dextrose or 0.9% sodium chloride. 
coming to the clinical pharmacology, the uh, routes through which can uh, through which we can give phenylephrine hydrochloride are intravenous, oral, intranasal, ophthalmic, subcutaneous, intramuscular, and topical. Coming to the dosage, intramuscular subcutaneous route, the dose is two to five milligram. Intravenously, fifty to two hundred microgram as bolus, and 0.1 to one point five microgram per kilogram per minute as infusion. In children, the dose is 0.5 to 1 microgram per kilogram as IV bolus and 0.1 to 0.5 microgram per kilogram per minute as IV infusion. And uh, the intramuscular or subcutaneous dose for children is also 2 to 5 milligram. Coming to the onset of action, it is 10 to 15 minutes following intramuscular or subcutaneous route and it is immediate following IV administration. Duration of action is 1 to 2 hours for intramuscular or subcutaneous, and five to 10 minutes for IV administration. T half of phenylephrine hydrochloride is five minutes following IV administration. Coming to the mechanism of action, it is an alpha-1 adrenoreceptor agonist, and it, cause, it is a peripheral vasoconstrictor and causes a reflex bradycardia. It acts primarily on large arterioles and lesser, lesser on terminal arterioles. The alpha-1 receptors are present in all blood vessels, which causes in and it causes vasoconstriction and increases the total peripheral resistance. In mucosa, it causes decongestion. And in eyes, it acts on the radial muscles of iris and causes mitriasis. Now, on the skin, it causes contraction of pilomotor muscles and it increases gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, leading to hyperglycemia. The alpha 1 receptor, adrenergic receptors, are located on post synaptic on effector cells. And the effects are contraction of smooth muscles of blood vessels, which increases the systemic vascular resistance, and radial muscles of iris, which cause midriasis in uterus, urinary bladder, trigone, it causes contraction, and GIT sphincters. Alpha-1 adrenal receptors are G-protein coupled receptors, and its stimulation causes activation of phospholipase C, increasing inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol, and ultimately increasing the intracellular calcium, leading to smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction, mimicking the effect of sympathetic nerve activation to blood vessels. Coming to the systemic effects of phenylephrine, first one in the cardiovascular system, it causes increase in systolic BP and diastolic BP due to increase in systemic vascular resistance. A reflex bradycardia occurs, which may cause a decrease in cardiac output. The reflex bradycardia occurs due to the due to the baroreceptor mediated reflex. And it is not arrhythmogenic. The overall effect of intravenous phenylephrine on cardiac output is complex and is variable based on the based on bolus versus infusion dosing, volume status, baseline heart rate, autonomic tone, and cardiac pathology of the patient. If the intravascular volume status of the patient is good, phenylephrine increases the cardiac output according to the Starling's law. If the sympathetic tone is increased in a patient with impaired cardiac status, the cardiac output will decrease. This is a picture showing the effect of phenylephrine on cardiac output. The cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. The phenylephrine decreases the heart rate and uh, it, the effects are reflex bradycardia, venoconstriction and arterial constriction. The uh, modulators for reflex bradycardia are autonomic tone, reflex sensitivity, and baseline heart rate of the patient. And modulators for venous constriction are venous contractility and preload responsiveness. The venous constriction will lead to increase in preload, which will increase the stroke volume. And next one, arterial constriction will, call, will increase the afterload. And the modulators for the arterial constriction are arterial contractility, ability of the heart to maintain stroke volume despite the, in, despite the increase in the afterload. So cardiac output may increase or decrease uh, when uh, phenylephrine is given, depending on the cardiac status of the patient. In central nervous system, it has no stimulatory effect and it, and it doesn't cross this blood-brain barrier. In renal system, blood flow falls in a manner similar to that demonstrated by noradrenaline. And in urinary bladder and uterus, it causes contraction. And in eyes, the mediatic effect through direct action on sympathetic nerve receptors located on the pupillary dilator muscles of iris 
and also decreases the acute secretion. Metabolic effect, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and also decrease the release of insulin, which will lead to hyperglycemia. Coming to the uses of phenylephrine hydrochloride, it commonly used as a vasopressor for patients with hypotension secondary to vasodilatory effects of anesthetic medications or non-cardiac shock states. And it is used to, to treat hypotension following neuraxial anesthesia and obstructives. The sympathectomy resulting from neuraxial blockade is exaggerated by physiological changes of pregnancy. So the phenylephrine lead to an increase in systemic vascular resistance and rise in mean arterial pressure. It has less incidence of fetal acidosis and is more effective at maintaining maternal blood pressure and preventing intraoperative nausea and vomiting. Uh, compared with ephedrine, it has rapid onset and short duration of action. Ephedrine has a delayed onset and long duration of action. Also, ephedrine has five-fold increased risk of fetal acidosis. So, phenylephrine is better than ephedrine. Next use, it is more commonly used to treat hypotension due to vasodilatation in patients with ischemic heart disease where tachycardia may be undesirable. Next use, in hypertrophic subbiotic stenosis or dynamic left ventricular up, outflow obstruction from systolic anterior motion of mitral leaflet, the dynamic nature of the outflow of obstruction is such that they worsen as ventricular volume decreases because of increased contractility. So phenylephrine will increase the afterload and decreases the contractility. And so it, uh, it causes decrease in the obstruction in these patients. Next one in aortic stenosis, as left ventricular afterload is relatively fixed and uh, fixed, increases in diastolic blood pressure may increase the coronary perfusion and also reduction in heart rate may improve diastolic filling time and minimize the myocardial oxygen consumption. Next one, for management of hypercyanotic spells in patients with tetralogy of phallic, uh, the phenylephrine increases the systemic vascular resistance, thereby lessens the right to left shunting and improve the arterial oxygenation. And the dose for this uh, in patients with TOF is bolus dose of 10 microgram per kilogram intravenously, and infusion dose is 2 to 5 microgram per kilogram per minute. Next use in the supraventricular tachycardia with hypotension. And also it is used as a midriatic agent to examine the fundus of the eyes. Uh, it, it is available in the concentration of 1%, 2.5% and 10%. It acts on the alpha-1 receptors in radial dilated pupillary muscles. And phenylephrine is also used as nasal decongestant and available in 0.125 to 1% solution. It causes vasoconstriction in nasal blood vessels and relieves the congestion. It can be used as a topical application in, case, in uh, case of hemorrhoids and it will cause consumption of the blood vessels. Next use, phenylephrine is not routinely recommended in the septic shock except in the following situations. Norepinephrine associated with serious arrhythmias and cardiac output is known to be high and BP persistently low. A salvage treatment when combined ionotrope or vasopressor drugs and low-dose vasopressin have failed to achieve the MAP target. And the dose for uh, dose of phenylephrine in septic shock is 0.4 to 9.1 microgram per kilogram per minute. And it can be used in patients with neurogenic shock secondary to acute traumatic spinal cord injury that produces a systemic vasodilatory state, often in the setting of preserved cardiac output. These injuries require higher target MAP, that is 85 to 90 mmHg, to maintain spinal cord perfusion and reduce secondary injury. So phenylephrine can be used. But the first line drugs are noradrenaline and adrenaline. Coming to the pharmacokinetics, it is subject to, to do extensive first pass metabolism and the oral bioavailability is 40% compared to IV administration. And it rapidly distributes into peripheral tissue on IV administration. Volume of distribution is large, and it is extensively metabolized in the gut wall and liver. Principal routes of metabolism are oxidation by monoamino oxidase, sulfate, and glucuronate conjugation. Metabolites are inactive and excreted in urine. Coming to the adverse effects, uh, there is dose-related hypertension and reflex bradycardia can occur. In rapid IV injection in patients with coronary artery disease produces dose-dependent peripheral vasoconstriction and increase in systemic blood pressure 
accompanied by decrease in cardiac output. And extra vasation may cause tissue necrosis, but uh, phenylephrine can be given peripherally. Uh, it is, uh, the tissue necrosis is uh, less compared with other agents, and it can cause hypertension, uh, which leads to headache, vomiting, cerebral hemorrhage, or pulmonary edema. Then angina, palpitation, cardiac arrest, dizziness, flushing, urinary retention, difficulty in micturation, and altered glucose metabolism. Coming to the contraindications, phenylephrine contains sodium metabisulfate, a sulfate that may cause allergic reaction in susceptible pe people. Then patients on uh, monoamino oxidase inhibitors or within 14 days of stopping the drug. Then patients with severe hypertension, bradycardia, autonomic dysfunction, and hypothyroidism. Then patients with ischemic heart disease, occlusive vascular disease, for example, atherosclerosis, aneurysm. Then closed angle glaucoma, diabetes mellitus, and in pregnancy, first uh, trimester. Coming to the drug interactions, phenylephrine may cause ventricular fibrillation if used with halothane or cyclopropyl. And phenylephrine may increase the risk of arrhythmias if given along with cardiac glycosides, quinidine, and tricyclic antidepressants. And it also reverses the action of antihypertensives. Nancy, please continue. Any issues? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sir, next one, overdose of phenylephrine can cause headache, vomiting, hypertension, reflex bradycardia and acidosis. Treat symptomatically with supportive measures. And we can counter the hypertension with alpha blocker like fentolamine. It is an alpha-1 agonist, antagonist. In the dose of 5 to 60 milligram intravenously over 10 to 13 minutes, 30 minutes, and repeat as necessary. Thank you all. Dr. Shoba, madam. Please unmute. Please unmute, uh, madam. Dr. Shoba, madam, please unmute. Can the next Hello. person, uh, Dr. Parvati? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yes ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there are no questions, Parvati can go on to her session. Over are you, you using, uh, Shabha, are you using regularly phenylephrine for all patients? We are, not using, we are not using for all patients. In obstetric cases, uh, we do you, use phenylephrine. You pre prefer to use phenylephrine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And one more thing I, I wanted to add, uh, the, uh, the company has come out with uh, 50 microgram per ml. Now uh, the new phenylephrine. So that will be very useful instead of uh, diluting. Then it's neon. Yeah, yeah, neon has come. The only some problem is the, how to dilute the drug and to set it up, it will take some time. Yeah, the, the, this one, the new yeah. one is 50 microgram per ml. Um, the is 10 ml vials are available. Okay, over to you, Parvati. Good, uh, good evening, teachers and my dear friends. I am here to discuss double lumen tube. Lung isolation is uh, whenever the non-diseased lung is threatened with contamination by blood or pus from the diseased lung, the lungs must be isolated to prevent potentially life-threatening complications. Lung separation is including all other indications for one lung ventilation. 
uh, in which there is no risk of contamination of the dependent lung. So indications for lung isolation, absolute indications include, first one to avoid spillage or contamination uh, in case of pulmonary hemorrhage, lung abscess or infected cyst, and for differential ventilation, in case of pulmonary fistula and bronchopleural cutaneous fistula, uh, a large unilateral bullae, bronchial trauma, severe unilateral lung conditions, unilateral lung lavage, and after unilateral lung transplantation, with, uh, where there is both lungs with different compliance. And for surgical indications, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, robotic assisted thoracoscopic surgery, robotic assisted minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And the relative indications include for high priority surgical exposure in case of upper lobectomy, pneumonectomy, lung volume reduction surgery, open aortic aneurysm rupture, minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And for low priority surgical exposure includes esophageal surgery, middle and lower lobectomy, thymectomy, sympathectomy and thoracic spine surgery. So methods of lung separation include broadly into double lumen tubes, the bronchial blockers used along with the single lumen endotracheal tubes and the endobronchial tube. The double lumen tubes include reusable tubes like Arlen's, Bry Smith, Sol's, White's and Robert Shaw. Disposable ones include Portex, Sheridan, Shirai, Rush and Malinclot Bronchocat. Bronchial blockers include the univent system, uh, the ant blocker, Cohen flexitive deflecting endobronchial blocker, Rush bifid EZ blocker, Fuji Uni blocker, and bronchial blocker independent of a single lumen tube, and also the endobronchial tubes. The do so the double lumen tubes are the currently most widely used means for achieving lung separation and one lung ventilation. There, ha there are dif several different types of double lumen tubes which are similar in design. Consists of two endotracheal tubes which are bonded together. One lumen is long enough to reach a main, a main stem bronchus and, uh, left, uh, and the side is based on the uh, main stem bronchus in, to which it is designated. And the second lumen ends with an opening in the distal trachea. It consists of two cuffs, a proximal tracheal cuff and a distal bronchial cuff located in the main stem bronchus. The endobronchial cuff of a right-sided tube is slotted so, or otherwise designed to allow ventilation of the right upper lobe because the right main stem bronchus is too short to accommodate both the right lumen tip and the right bronchial cuff. These are the uh, different types of the double lumen tubes uh, used earlier. The uh, car lens include uh, uh, two lumens uh, uh, and there is a carinal hoop which helps in uh, placement and it minimizes the displacement. And it is available as left-sided tubes and white tube, which is the right-sided tube with the carinal hoop and a Bryce Smith tube where the two lumens are uh, present anteroposteriorly. And there is no hook and uh, we have both left and right sided tubes. Robert Shaw tubes, which are which we use now, consists of the lumen, which is the D-shaped lumen. And uh, it does not contain a carinal hook and uh, left and right sided tubes are available. So about the Robert Shaw tube, it is a bifurcated tube with both an endotracheal and endobronchial lumen and can be used to isolate, selectively ventilate or collapse the right or left lung independently according to the operative approach. It, it was first designed by the Carlins and Bijou in 1950, later, uh, uh, later uh, designed by the Robert Shaw uh, with the lack of carinal hoop. It is a, the cross section is D-shaped. It is made of uh, polyvinyl chloride, easy to watch tidal volume movements. Most double lumen tubes have co color-coded cuffs and pilot balloons. A bronchial cuff, which is a, typically a high pressure, low volume cuff with blue pilot balloon. And tracheal cuff, which is a high volume, low pressure cuff with a clear cuff. It is supplied in package containing the double lumen tube, stylet, port connectors, and suction catheters without, without the CPAP apparatus for a non-dependent lung. Different sizes are available as prime sizes 26, 28, 32, 35, 37, 39, and 41. This is the picture of the uh, left-sided double lumen tube, which contains both the uh, two lumens, the bronchial lumen uh, and the tracheal lumen. Tracheal lumen, uh, 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 tracheal uh, cuff is proximal and bronchial cuff is distal and there is a port connector and separate uh, pilot balloon and uh, inflation tube for the, uh, both the lumens. The safety features of double lumen tube, the, uh, there are standardized 50 millimeters connectors for all airway devices. It is low al allergen PVC construction, which is latex free. It has a transparent body to see tidal volume movements and blood or vomit. It a high volume, low pressure cuff to seal the trachea, pilot cuff to gauge for cuff pressure, rounded atraumatic edges, Murphy's eye to protect against occlusion, Radiopaque line to help positioning on chest X-ray. Blue designation for the endobronchial components. 
soft silicon portion of the port conductor for easy clamping without fracturing. Low volume, high pressure endobronchial cuff to prevent herniation across carina and mucosal ulceration. Specifically designed eccentric balloons for right WMN tube to prevent right upper lobe bronchus obstruction. So we have the uh, right upper lobe bronchus uh, uh, being, uh, 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 we, when we use the right sided tube, it contains a slot for uh, preferential uh, ventilation of the right upper lobe. So anatomical consideration. The right main stem bronchus is shorter, straighter, and has a large diameter than the left. It takes off from the trachea at an angle of 25 degrees in adult. And the left main bronchus diverges from the median plane at 45 degree angle. These angles are likely slightly larger in children. So the right upper lobe bronchus take off very close to the origin of the right main stem bronchus, which is 1.5 to 2 centimeter from the carina. So these anatomical features mean that it is usually easier to incubate the right main stem bronchus than the left but more difficult to place a tube in the right mainstream main stem bronchus without obstructing the upper lobe orifice. So this is, these are the measurements, related measurements, where we can see the left main bronchus is longer uh, than the right uh, main bronchus, uh, than the uh, upper lobe orifice opens very near to the carina, which is about two centimeters from the carina. So which side? Right and left DLGs are uh, used to account for the anatomical differences between the right and left mainstem bronchus, which we have already discussed. Most commonly, the left-sided ones are used. Uh, right-sided DLGs are difficult to position correctly due to the individual variations in the right upper lobe carina distance. So the conditions were left DLT is not preferred choice. Uh, include the distorted anatomy of the entrance of left mainstem bronchus. So in these cases, we use the right DLT, where there is external or intraluminal tumor, tumor compression descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. And for left pneumonectomy, uh, bronchopleural fistula of the left main bronchus and left uh, bronchial surgery, left lung transplantation, in all these cases, we use right-sided right, uh, DLGs. Then selective lobar blockade is planned, where we use a bronchial blocker. Then upper airway abnormalities, we use a bronchial blocker or an uh, endotracheal tube, a bronchial blocker combo. An intubated patient who cannot tolerate off IPPV, we use a bronchial blocker with already positioned DTT. Then patient with nasal ETT in position with doubtful upper airway, we also use bronchial blocker through a nasal endotracheal tube. Sizing. A properly sized DLT is one in which the main body of the tube passes without resistance through the glottis and advances easily within the trachea and in which the bronchial component passes into the intended progress without difficulty. Adult DLTs come in sizes 35, 37, 39, and 41 French. French scale is the external diameter of the tracheal segment times three. Some manufacturers also provide 26, 28, 30 to French uh, sizes for uh, younger patients. Then the diameter of the double lumen tube, uh, bronchial lumen, should be one to two millimeters smaller than the intubated bronchus. And largest tube uh, offers least resistance, small bronchial cuff volumes, and less herniation across the carina. So, uh, measurement uh, introduction of a scale on the side of present side chest x rays, calculate and choose the right size of the double lumen tubes. And uh, direct measurement of the diameter of the tracheal bit from edge to edge at the infraclavicular plane, interclavicular plane uh, from the preoperative pre uh, uh, postro anterior chest radiograph is recommended. And CT scan, uh, where we can measure the left or right mid and bronchial diameters. And a properly sized uh, double human tube, uh, uh, the bronchial tip uh, is one to two millimeters less wide than the patient's bronchial diameter to allow for uh, the space occupied by the deflated bronchial cup. So this is how uh, we choose uh, the size of the double lumen tube uh, according to the tracheal width and the bronchial diameter, which are more than 18 millimeters of tracheal width and more, more than 12 millimeters of uh, bronchial diameter, we choose a size of 41. More than 16 tracheal diameter, more than 12, we use a 39 French, more than equal to 50 and 11, uh, 37, and more than equal to 40 and 10, uh, we use 35, more than equal to 12.5 and less than 10, we use a size 32. More than equal to 11, we use a size of 28. And also, we can use multi detected CT scan of the chest, which allows appreciation of any abnormal tracheobronchial anatomy before placement of the double lumen tube. And a three dimensional image reconstruction of the tracheobronchial anatomy from the spiral CT scan combined with the superimposed transparencies of the double lumen tubes help choosing the appropriate double lumen tube. And there are other measurements like using the using guiding table of a, a patient's gender and height. So for every female uh, who is with the heights less than 160 centimeters, 
uh, we commonly use a uh, size of uh, 35 French for female, more than 160 centimeter high, we say size 37. For males, less than 170 centimeter size, uh, 170 centimeters of height, we use 39. And for males, more than 170 centimeter height, we use a size 41. So in adults, the mean diameter of the cricoid ring is approximately same as that of the left mainstream bronchus. In children, age, but not the weight is a predictor of bronchial diameter. And the right main bronchial diameter is significantly larger than the left. So for children, 8 to 10 years, uh, size is 26 French. 10 to 12, 26 to 28 French. 12 to 14 years, 32 French. 14 to 16 years, 35 French. So these are the uh, size of the flexible fiber optic bronchoscope recommended for different size of DLGs, including 26 and 28, which are the pediatric size. FOB recommended size is 2.2 and for uh, 35 and above, um, FOB size recommended is 3.5 or 2.2. Depth of insertion is determined by the appropriate bronchial cuff position confirmed by bronchoscopy. In adults, the depth is measured at the teeth with approximately 12 plus patient height in centimeter by 10 centimeter or approximately 29 plus or minus 1 centimeter for every 10 centimeter difference from 170 centimeters. Average lip measurement includes 29 plus or minus 2 centimeters. And another uh, measurement is the parasitical distance parallel to the trachea from the angle of mouth to the angle of Louis plus 3 centimeter to reach the left mainstem bronchus. The margin of safety. This is the length of the tracheobronchial tree over which a double lumen tube may be moved or positioned without obstructing a conducting airway, which, which is higher for the left-sided tubes due to longer length of the left mainstem bronchus. The difference between the length of the left mainstem bronchus and the length of the cuff and tip of the bronchial segment is termed as the margin of safety. And if the length of the cuff plus the tip exceeds that of the left main bronchus, there will be occlusion of the left upper lobe bronchus. So advantages of double lumen tubes include it is the best device for absolute lung isolation, quickest to place successfully, conversion back and forth from one lung ventilation to total lung ventilation, large lumen, uh, so it allows for suction of both lungs individually, can be placed without a fiber optic bronchoscope. We can apply CPAP to the non-dependent lung and PEEP to the dependent lung, and we, it allows for a bronchoscopy to the isolated lung. Disadvantages include limited available sizes, difficulty in selecting the size, appropriate sizes depend on the patient height and length of the trachea, Difficult to place during laryngoscopy, a major tracheobronchial injuries, intraoperative displacement, not ideal for postoperative ventilation, must be changed out for a regular endotracheal tube for postoperative ventilation. So, placement of a double lumen tube, preparation, pick the size chosen as per the recommendation, measure the angle of mouth to angle of Louis length and add 3 centimeters, correlate it with the accepted depth of insertion as per the formula, and test and confirm the competence of the cuffs. Confirms that each inflation tube is associated with the proper cuff. The cuffs and stylet should be lubricated with a water-soluble lubricant. Ensure that the stylet does not protrude beyond the bronchial tip. The connector should be assembled so that it can be quickly fitted to the tube and breathing system after intubation. A fiber optic bronchoscope should be available to confirm and position, confirm the position of the double lumen tube. So insertion techniques include the blind insertion technique and a fiber optic guided placement. The blind technique, we can carry out direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy. First, advance the bronchial cuff through the glottis with the concave, concave curvature anteriorly. Take the stylet out once the interbronchial cuff has passed beyond the vocal cords. Then rotate it 90 degree counterclockwise for left-sided double lumen tubes or clockwise for right-sided double lumen tubes. Advance further until slight resistance is encountered, which indicates that the interbronchial lumen has entered the bronchus. Inflate both the cuffs, attach Y connector and circuit, and ventilate. Note the depth of insertion of double lumen tube. Using fiber optic bronchoscope, fiber optic bronchoscope is introduced through the bronchial lumen and railroad the double lumen tube over the bronchoscope. Check for the tube placement by auscultation or using a fiber optic bronchoscope. Checking uh, clinically, first inflate the tracheal cuff with 5 to 10 ml and ensure ventilation of both lungs. By inspection and auscultation, inflate the bronchial cuff one ml at a time until the leak stops. When late, and we, can, we will get uh, bilateral breath sounds. Then clamp off the gas flow through the tracheal lumen and open the ceiling cap to the air. Check for uh, unilateral breath sounds uh, through the bronchial lumen. 
check whether uh, we can isolate the other lung through the tr uh, tracheal lumen by clamping of gas flow through the bronchial lumen. So, once inserted, double lumen tube is connected uh, to, to the breathing circuit uh, with the DLT connector and the detection of the entire carbon dioxide confirms placement in the trachea after both cuffs are inflated to seal leaks. Cuff pressures should be measured to prevent airway injury. And fibroscopic confirmation, the recommended size, uh, as we have already discussed, is 2.8 mm4, uh, sizes 26, 28, 32 French, and more than or equal to 3.5 mm4, sizes 35 and above. So, a left DLT, while viewing through the tracheal lumen, a minimally visible inflated blue bronchial cuff can be seen in the left, left main stem at the level of carina and with a patent right bronchus. And the bronchial cuff should be within 5 millimeters of the carina. And while viewing through the bronchial lumen, a clear view of the le left secondary carina can be seen. The orifices of both left upper and le lower lobe should be identified to avoid distal impaction in the left lower lobe and occlusion of the left upper lobe. So this is the these are the views through the first one through the bron uh, through the uh, tracheal lumen and the other one through the bronchial lumen. Right sided double lumen tubes. While viewing through the tracheal lumen, minimally visible bronchial, blue bronchial cuff in the right main stem bronchus at the level of carina and a painted left main stem bronchus. Viewing through the bronchial lumen, a visible right upper lobe bronchus aligned with the ventilation sideboard can be seen, as well as a clear view of the right middle and lower lobe bronchi distally from the bronchial lumen can be seen. Going inside this right upper lobe with the bronchoscope should reveal three orifices for the apical, anterior, and posterior. This is the only structure in the tracheobronchial tree that has three orifices. In the supine patient, the takeoff of the right upper lobe is normally on the lateral wall of the right mainstream bronchus at the 3 to 4 o'clock position in relation to main carina. Some DLTs have a thick white radiopaque line that can lead the operator into the opening of the right upper lobe bronchus. This is the view for the right sided DLTs. So, the optimal position for the right and left sided double lumen tubes. So, to initiate one lung ventilation, the bronchial cuff is inflated. The lung to be isolated is clamped off to the corresponding connector and the connector is then opened to atmosphere to allow full lung collapse. And the lung collapse is most rapid if initiated at end expiration. Intraoperatively, the bronchial cuff should be kept deflated and should be inflated only during the time of lung isolation to minimize bronchial mucosal injury. So troubleshooting techniques for double lumen tube insertion, always uh, using by using a bronchoscope to cannulate the bronchus and railroad over the scope, uh, use uh, place always place the scope in the bronchial lumen. A stylet should be used when placing a double lumen tube. Always check placement when changes to both patient's position have been made or changes have been made between normal ventilation and isolated lung ventilation. Rotate the double lumen tube towards the desired bronchus once the bronchial cuff crosses the cords. After inflating both cuffs and checking for bilateral breath sounds, if breath sounds are heard on the left side only, it indicates that the tube is too far down with the tracheal opening also in the bronchus. So we have to pull out the double lumen tube. After clamping the tracheal lumen, if there is persistence of breath sounds on both sides, it indicates that the bronchial opening is still in the trachea and so the tube should be advanced. If there is absence of breath sounds over the entire right lung, and a left upper lobe, it indicates that the tube is too far down the left bronchus and need to be pulled up a little. If unilateral, only right-sided breath sounds are heard, it indicates the incorrect entry of the tube in the right bronchus and the tube has to be reintroduced. So after unclamping the tracheal lumen and clamping the bronchial lumen, if there is absence or diminution of breath sounds on both sides, it indicates that the tube is not far enough down and bronchial cuff is occluding the distal trachea. So we have to deflate both the cuff and push uh, the DLT down so that the bronchial cuff enters the left bronchus and uh, otherwise the DLT has to be reintroduced. Complications, failure of intubation uh, because it is not exactly easy or it easy to insert occupy, uh, man positioning, uh, successful tracheal intubation but wrong bronchial intubation and displacement. Tracheobronchial tree disruption due to excessive volume and pressure in bronchial balloon, inappropriate size selection, malposition, and tracheal laryngitis in case of a carinal hoop, right upper lobe collapse with the right double lumen tubes, inadvertent stapling of the endobronchial lumen in the bronchus, injury to lips, tongue, and during laryngoscopy. To avoid uh, tracheobronchial tree disruption, stay cautious with patients with bronchial wall abnormalities. 
pick an appropriate size tube avoid malpositioning we always use fiber optic bronchoscope avoid over inflation of the endobronchial cuff deflate endobronchial cuff during turning the tube inflate endobronchial cuff slowly inflate endobronchial cuff with inspired gases contraindications due to larger size and more complex design of than single lumen tube intubation uh, with a double lumen tube can be a challenge even in a patient with normal airway so it is relatively contraindicated in patient with full stomach uh, distorted anatomy due to lesions along the path of insertion limited mouth opening and anticipated difficult intubation and extremely critically ill who have regular endotracheal tube and cannot tolerate without mechanical ventilation and beep even for a short of period thank you thank you that was a very comprehensive uh, talk on dld very well presented over to ma'am shobha ma'am any uh, thank you dr vijish if there are any doubts or questions uh, parvati can answer i think i think there was a question yeah. in the chat box about whether we can use a right sided tube for a left sided lesion i think there was a question like that yeah yeah can you use a right sided tube for a left sided lesion parvati uh, yes. so we can use a right sided tube uh, so, so that we can isolate the right uh, uh, right side right uh, lung but it is uh, difficult to introduce and there is chance for occlusion of the right upper lobe bronchus true so you must always confirm it with a fiber optic scope bronchus can you just Any reiterate can you just reiterate the uh, indications of a right sided double lumen indications for a right sided tube i think you have shown it in the previous slide no yeah, yeah. just to the... reinforce just to reinforce that reinforce. these are the few conditions in which a dlt right sided dlt can be you can probably show that slide once more parvati few conditions where the right sided tube is preferred so whenever you have a intraluminal lesion left sided lesions yeah left sided lesions left -sided and a left yeah, sided tracheobronchial disruption so these are disruptions you cannot put a uh, left sided yeah. tube yeah. i think this everybody should yeah 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 right that's sided the right dlt to be used no the uh, yeah this leg yeah these are the indications so for using a right sided tube Right, DLT. Yeah. Since that question was yeah. yeah, since that question was asked, I thought this should be shown so that the right DLT. These are the few indications where it, the right DLT is indicated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ansi and Parvati. Both were very good presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shabshad, ma'am, if there are no further questions, we can. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, they have presented very nicely, and uh, and it was so so elaborate also. <laughs> they have yeah. covered almost all my yes. There's a comprehensive <laughs> presentation on. Uh, a comprehensive, and they have made covered all the points. Correct. There's one more question yeah. coming up. Uh, uh, How to differentiate? right sided tube from left sided when the level no, no, no. Let's how how can you differentiate a right sided and left sided tube that is uh, the common thing that we always do no always how to hold the tube and you look at the distal end and if it's facing towards the left it will be the left sided if it is facing towards the right it will be the right sided okay. I hope I have answered that question. Yes, 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 yes ma'am. And maintenance of oxygenation while normal. ventilating one side. Uh, maintenance of oxygenation. Ma management of difficult. hypoxia during one lung. Yeah, management okay. of hypoxia during okay. one lung. Hypoxia during one side. That's also another important question that you usually ask. Yes, yes, yes. So, what do we do in that situation? you can cut off the nitrous oxide increase the or fio2 to 100%, 100 maintain percent. mac of inhalation agents around 1 mac because if it is more than 1 mac that can again interfere with, uh, mm -hmm. with the hypoxic pulmonary mm -hmm. vasoconstriction 
always you can uh, ensure the positioning using the paper optic scope and make sure that secretions blood everything is removed and uh, if still it is not picking you can target the saturation of 90% uh, and above if it is still desaturating you can switch over to two lung ventilation and inform your surgeon this actually a team work between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist is very important for one lung ventilation and also we can oxygenate uh, one lung we can uh, give oxygen separately through a tube or through the yeah you can give yeah. cpap through the yeah, non ventilated yes, lung some, and sure. feed to the dependent mm -hmm. lung Okay. These are also the, difficult situations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These are the common Something methods that... Something you can that... do e easily is probably you can introduce an oxygen source into the uh, non-ventilated lung. and non ventilating lung. That's it. So see, uh, this is also another important question that is usually asked for one lung maintenance of oxygenation while one lung ventilation. Mm -hmm. Hypoxia is more common with the right-sided procedure, no? Because the right-sided yeah. lung is bigger. Someone has asked about the tidal volume. How much you have to keep? 5.26 ml per kg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, congratulations both of you for the nice presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And also, thank you, Shobha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shamshat. Vijesh, shall we go to the next yeah. one? That is Pabraj. Yeah. yeah, sure. We'll go to the next. Ma'am, it's visible, right? My screen share yes. is visible? Yeah. So I'm starting. Okay. Good evening. Yeah. Okay. Let me thank ISA for giving me this opportunity. Very good. Positioning is a teamwork. And moreover, every position is associated with significant physiological changes. During the next 30 minutes, We'll try to find out answers to these three questions. What is it? Why is it important? And how is it done? What is it? Patient positioning is done for better access to the surgical field. And the positions are different for different surgical procedures. And commonest one may be supine. Others are prone, lateral, sitting, and lithotomy. Why are we concerned about it? We are concerned about positioning because of the effect of positioning on five factors. Number one is airway. Number two, respiratory system. The third one is hemodynamics. Then comes the nerve injuries, the potential nerve injuries and the pressure effects. So whenever a patient is positioned, you have to ask, a question yourself whether this particular position is going to affect these five factors. I repeat, airway, respiratory system, hemodynamics, nerve injury, chances of nerve injury, and also pressure effect. What about supine position? It is the commonest one. Of course, patient lies on back with head, neck, and spine in neutral position, and arms can be kept in Two ways. One is arms can be kept adducted with a draw sheet. You can see in the picture the arms are kept adducted or it can be kept abducted. But whenever arm is abducted, make sure that abduction should not exceed 90 degrees. Why? This is to avoid pressure of humerus on the axilla. You can see the head of the humerus. This may press on the axilla and can lead on to brachial plexus injury. Now regarding the use of draw sheet, Look at this picture. This is the patient 
you are looking from above head body and arm this is the draw sheet can you see and the draw sheet is stuck around the arm and then it should go beneath the patient it should never go beneath the or mattress so this is the right method so this is the right method and this is the wrong method where the draw sheet is going beneath the mattress now what are the effects of superimposition on various systems in the lung functional residual capacity is reduced after induction of anesthesia if closing capacity exceeds frc hypoxia can happen so a minimum pip is desirable in most of the modern anesthesia machines are having facility to uh, fix the pip and in supine position aortocal compression can happen in pregnancy so left uterine tilt is mandatory uh, when the patient is placed supine there will be pressure effect especially on the occiput shoulder blades ulnar nerve sacrum and heels when there is pressure that can lead on to low pressure then ischemia and finally tissue breakdown this picture shows you the pressure effects the occiput the shoulder blades ulnar nerve sacrum and heel so proper padding of all these areas is mandatory now nerve injuries can happen in a supine position also the mechanism mechanisms of nerve injuries are one is compression nerve is compressed uh, between a bony prominence and bed or something else and second is excessive stretch especially if the position is not done in a proper way especially of the upper limbs and lower limbs etc excessive stretch can happen to the nerves and this can lead on to ischemia and ulnar nerve is a commonest nerve injured in supine position it is a superficial nerve and it will be compressed against medial epicondyle so what is the position of forearm forearm is to be supinated and a little flexed with the proper padding brachial plexus injury is also not uncommon this is because of stretching when arm is abducted to more than 90 degrees this will happen so always keep the arm less than 90 degrees and external rotation of the arm is to be avoided and what about the position of the head always head is turned towards the abducted arm or you can put the head in the neutral position but when the head is turned to the opposite side there is a chance of stretch on the brachial plexus so the nerve injuries which can happen during supine position are brachial plexus injury and also ulnar injury and radial nerve is also prone this this picture uh, shows you the position of the radial nerve in the radial groove this is a posterior aspect of the shoulder and the upper limb you can see it is crossing and prolonged compression can lead on to radial nerve palsy also so in this picture the upper one is a wrong method you can see the armrest and table are not aligned and the edge of the table is compressing the radial nerve and moreover the position of the forearm it is extended the lower one is the best one you can see the forearm is a little flexed which will prevent pressure on the ulnar nerve and there is good alignment between the armrest and the table what happens to the lung respiratory system in the supine position you can see the different lung get good perfusion but ventilation is less the opposite thing for the non dependent lung the perfusion is less and there is over increased ventilation so ventral lung gets more perfusion sorry ventral lung get less perfusion and over distended and the dorsal lung that means dependent lung is collapsed but over perfuse and this can lead on to what this can lead on to vq mismatch so that is about supine position now long chair position is a modification of supine position here you can see 
just look at the legs the level the legs are positioned at the level of the heart so this will facilitate venous return and it is little flexed the joint and look at the hips the hips are so hips are also flexed so that will reduce the stress on the back and also hip joint and look at the abdomen the distance between the cephoid process and pubis is less so that will relax the abdominal muscles also this is called lawn chair position very especially prolonged procedures that will not cause much stress strain, strain and stress on the spine so we can reduce post operative back ache also now trendenberg position is a modification of supain position and this is used for gynecological procedures usually it is 10 to 15 degree head down which you can see on the left side on the right side there is a steep head down which is used for laparoscopic pelvic or gynecological procedures now what are the prob problems look at the venous return so venous return is facilitated so it is good for the heart but remember if patient has failure or something that may lead on to pulmonary edema and other problems what about respiratory system here respiratory system is at the risk because because of the head down position the abdominal contents are pushing the diaphragm up so that can reduce tidal volume functional vessel capacity it can reduce compliance of the lung and it can cause increase in the airway pressures also and what about edema yes edema is an issue especially facial edema lip edema laryngeal edema all this can happen if the surgery is done for a long duration one and how is the patient kept stable so there is always a chance for the patient to slip down so in the right sided picture you can see a pillow is placed beneath the knee so that will prevent the patient going up now is there any other method to prevent okay we were using um, and one more thing uh, there will be an increased icp because cerebral flow is increased and iop is also increased the shoulder braces are used but uh, some of the textbook says better avoid it you know the reason uh, when the patient is sliding down these shoulder braces will be giving a push up so that can lead on to compression of the brachial plexus so if you are using shoulder braces always make sure that the mattress is non sliding and the brace should compress only on acromion process you should never press on the soft tissues now what about reverse trendelenburg it's a modification of uh, supine position here head is up so okay lung is uh, good for lung because the pressure on the lung is reduced but what about uh, cardiovascular system see there is venous pooling about half to one liter of blood can get pooled in the lower limbs and which can reduce cardiac output and can cause hypotension and it can affect cerebral perfusion also and whenever this positioning uh, is done either trendelenburg or reverse it should be done in a slow slow fashion too fast turning is to be avoided now coming to prone position is a more complicated one look at the picture here patient is lying prone you can see two supports one beneath the pelvis and other beneath the thoracic cage arms are abducted and head is resting on a prone headrest you can see the knee joint is flex and this postural position is used for posterior spine surgeries lower extremity surgery fossa posterior fossa surgery and peri anal procedures or surgeries around the buttocks and always check the range of neck movements and the range of shoulder movements before patient is positioned and in this picture the head is in the headrest uh, sometimes head is turned to the side so in that position you have an access to airway you have an access to ett but remember no too much rotation of neck because it can cause this cervical spine injury and also occlusion of the blood vessels eyes 
take care to protect eyes always inspect just document because pressure on the eyeballs can cause ischemia retinal damage and blindness and uh, what about using a goggle the goggles can slip and it can cause more damage so better avoid goggles pad the eyes and frequently inspect also i told you earlier arms can be abducted or can be kept abducted now you have to pad all the pressure points no there is pressure on the breast there will be pressure on the genitals there will be pressure on the knee joint knee anterior part of the knee as well as on the toes so this picture clearly tells you the pressure effects starting from the toes knee genitals especially males chest breast chin elbows and so on so proper padding is mandatory now how to turn from supine to prone position the team speed is needed and the anesthetist is the leader total five persons are needed uh, anesthesiologist at the head end and two at pelvic girdle and two near the shoulder girdle so total four plus one detach all the monitors i may lines and anesthesiologist will be taking care of the head neck and endotracheal tube and when he says turn aloud the patient is turned laterally and then to prone position so here we have to make sure that cervical spine thoracic spine and lumbar spine all these three segments of the spine are moved in unison there should not be any rotatory movement or twisting movement and on patient is in the prone position make sure that there is no compression on the abdomen and on patient assumes the prone position immediately check the vital so you can use your pulse oximeter as well as nibp to check the heart rate and bp because if there is compression on the abdomen there is a chance that the inferior vena cava may be compressed and the venous return be reduced and there may be sudden onset of hypotension and what happens to the lung actually it is good for the lungs uh, you can see there is uh, better ventilation and uh, there is the vacuum is much is actually less than that in supine position so uh, usually for lung it is good but if that uh, the pillows which are placed in the mill in the pelvis or thoracic cavity is sliding and compressing on the abdomen then there will be Uh, limitation of the diaphragmatic movement diaphragmatic splinting can happen and then that can affect the respiratory system <coughs> what about lithotomy it is used for gynecological procedures urological procedures and a patient is placed supine and the legs are put on the leg rest there is a, something called a leg rest and usually stirrups are also used so here the most important point is you have to raise both the legs together simultaneously you have to elevate the legs bring to the a little flex the position of thigh and then put on the the leg rests or stirrups because if it is not done properly it can cause torsion on the pelvis and patient will be complaining of back pain later on and here venous return is promoted but a common pineal nerve injury is a potential problem especially by the, the leg rest and lower extremity combat syndrome is a rare but serious complication the predisposing factors are the obstruction to venous flow venous blood flow and reduced perfusion of the lower limbs in the post op period patient may be complaining of of pain so if patient complains so uh, uh, calf pain please rule out lower ex- extreme compartment syndrome and another problem is the hand finger injury okay this is a leg support this is stirrup and you can see this is compressing on to the common perineal nerve here and the neck of fibula can see here is a common perineal nerve 
and the leg support is compressing on the common perineal nerve and you know the result of common perineal nerve injury it is a foot and when the legs are this thighs are flexed too much flexion may lead on to the sciatic nerve injury sciatic nerve will be stretched here common perineal nerve and sciatic nerve and look at this picture here the arms are adducted and we can see the hand is near the edge of the table and there is one more portion for the table isn't this the distal part of the table usually it is folded and once the procedure is over this will be brought back to the normal position you can see and if the fingers are kept there the fingers will be caught between this portion of the table and rest of the table and crush injury can happen so be cautious about it now moving on to lateral position it is used for thoracotomy and total hip arthroplasty here arm is placed perpendicular to the body it can be placed on a pillow or on a over arm rest and you have to tape the arm also so while taping make sure that you are not impinging on the ulnar nerve or radial nerve and in thoracotomy usually arm is placed little higher usually above the level of the usually at the level of the head but make sure that you avoid brachial plexus injury so to avoid brachial plexus injury the arm is to be brought to more anterior plane so when the arm is placed it is brought little anterior and axillary roll is must which is placed below the chest and what's the purpose so when the patient is in the lateral position there will be too much pressure on the axilla which can cause one is brachial plexus uh, injury and also the vascular compression so in this position always check the pulse on the dependent arm you can place even your pulse oximeter there or even you can put the inner arterial line so that will give you an idea whether there is compression on the axillary vasculature see the patient is position and arm can be placed over a pillow you can see another pillow is placed between the knees for what this is to avoid compression on the saphenous nerve and this is the lower arm is at risk because there is a compression uh, there is possibility of compression at the level of axilla so here if it's a thoracotomy the arms are placed on a over arm rest and during when the bandage is applied make sure that you are not applying too much pressure on the radial nerve or ulnar nerve and here also look at the uh, the dependent hand arm it is at risk so a axillary an axillary roll is placed which will reduce the pressure on the axilla so here the hand is moved cephalar and anterior so that the stretch on the brachial plexus can be reduced now we can see the pressure areas heel ankle inner side and outer sides of knee hip elbow shoulder and ear that is very important you have to make sure that ear is not folded see even undue pressure on facial nerve can cause facial nerve palsy and even it can cause ischemia of the pin so make sure that the pinna is not folded can pad also so lateral oblique position you can call it as three quarters prone position patient is not in the exercise lateral position patient is in a three quarters prone position and this is particularly needed for posterior fossa surgery and upper neck procedures here you can see the axillary roll and you can see the non dependent lower limb is flexed and a pillow is placed to prevent you know pressure effect and lower part of the body look here the lower part body is brought to brought near the edge of the table and actually neck is flexed 
an extreme flexion is to be avoided because this can lead on to even quadriplegia. So too much flexion is to be avoided. And here, the dependent breast can be compressed and dependent axilla actually gets more pressure than in the lateral uh, position. So make sure you have an axillary roll. And lateral posterior kidney bridge is used for you know, renal surgeries, especially nephrectomies. So here, the kidney bridge is elevated, raised, and actually you can see there is pressure on IVC and also there will be restriction of movement of diaphragm. So this kidney bridge is not very much good for the cardiovascular system and the lungs. So always check BP because to get a better exposure, the urologist may go on elevating it, but you have to closely watch the blood pressure and also the airway pressures. If it is going very high, that means air pressure is going very high, or if the BP is falling, you have to tell the surgeon that there should be a compromise on the level of the kidney bridge. And it is other uh, problems are just like that of a lateral position. Now this picture is telling you about the contact pressures as various positions. So when you see at the level of inner nipple line, it is about 15 centimeters. When it is prone, without support, it is 17. And with support, you see pressure on this particular roll is 29. So these rolls should be well padded. Look at here at the level of your base. The so point is only 8. And here it is 4.5. And here it is about 28 centimeters. So these pillows should have proper padding with cotton. And this picture shows you the pressure effects. So always keep in mind the uh, these uh, pressure points in supine, in lateral and prone positions and take care of pressure points with proper padding. Now sitting position, it is used for posture cervical surgeries, posture for sub procedures. So surgeon, for surgeon, it will provide better exposure and also less bleeding. And in the sitting position, of course, we have we have better access to ETT and there is less chance of facial selling compared with prostate. But there are problems like venous air embolism, hypotension, and macroglossia. What's the reason for macroglossia? The tongue edema. So too much flexion of the neck is to be avoided. There should be two finger space between chin and sternum. So before the pins are fixed, you have to make sure that point. And look at the arms. The arms should not sag because if the arms sag, there will be brachioplasis injury. And there is a chance of ulnar nerve injury here and radial nerve injury. So a little shoulder shrug position is better. And what about venous return? Of course, hypotension can happen uh, because of the reduced venous return. And you can look at the hips. It is at the break and proper padding of buttox is essential because of the potential sciatic nerve injury. And legs are bent at knee joint. So here, there is difference in the mean arterial pressures. See, at the level of arm, it is 65. And at the level of uh, tragus, it is about 50 millimeter mercury because one centimeter rise will cause a drop in 0.75 millimeters mercury of MAP. So always keep in mind this point whenever you are using an NIBP. And if you are using an IBP, always transducer position should be at the level of the tragus so that it give you an idea regarding the pressure in the circle of illness. So during the last uh, 30 minutes, we have discussed about the importance of positioning because it gives good exposure. We also discussed about the potential physiological challenges and we discussed about
the supine position, the lateral position, the prone position, sitting position, and lithotomy position. Of course, proper positioning helps the surgeon for better access to surgical field, but it is a concern for the anesthesiologist due to the potential adverse effects. There should not be any compromise on patient safety at the expense of ease of surgical exposure. That is why I said it is a teamwork. We have to discuss with the surgeon. We have to tell the surgeon about the proper problems which can happen if the positioning is too extreme. And whenever the positioning is made, it should be done in a slow manner. Rapid changes can cause um, hemodynamic side effects. And during the positioning and after the positioning, monitoring is vital. And don't forget to pad all the pressure points. Please keep in mind that picture in which pressure points are noted. Always pad properly. And neuropathies, especially of ulnar, brachial plexus, common perineal, and sciatic nerve are devastating. So we have to prevent these neuropathies by preventing compression, preventing stretching, protect the eyes. Always protect the eyes, pad them properly, check them, and always consider an optimal airway. Consider optimal respiratory system. Optimize hemodynamics. Think about pressure points and optimize them by proper padding. And always optimize the nerve protection. So these five points, always you have to keep in mind. Whatever may be the position, you ask yourself, in this particular position, what is going to happen to my airway? The respiratory system, hemodynamics, pressure points, and Always anticipate and constantly monitor. And if a problem is detected, treat promptly. So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavrat, sir, for that, uh, for making positioning and anesthesia interesting and easy for us to understand. Babri sir is uh, live with us. If there are any queries, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer them. Sir, you're there, right? You're available. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Sir, which position will be most uh, um, most liable to cause venous thromboembolism? Next, uh, uh, lithotomy. Lithotomy is liable because there is a reduction in the perfusion as well. There is a reduction in the venous outflow. So that is why the compartment syndrome is implicated along with the lithotomy position. So there is a question in the chat box. How can we detect? The occurrence of uh, compartment syndrome, lower limb so, compartment syndrome. Okay, it is said that uh, the compartment syndrome usually happens when the surgical uh, the duration of surgery is very long, especially more than four hours. So it is suggested that if the surgery is too long, in between you need to uh, keep the limbs a little lowered and then put back. There is a suggestion, but I don't know whether it is practical or not. So any too much, too much, too much flexion is also avoided. Too much flexion because that is one of the causes of reduced venous drainage and maintained hemodynamics. That is also very important because if this particular patient goes for hypotension, so that will further reduce the perfusion of the limb. So these are the correctable factors which uh, we have to modify. Could you suggest any checklist once we place a patient in one certain position? Uh, could you suggest a checklist that we should? Yeah, do? actually, uh, ASA has a close claim, uh, close claim uh, database. So they have mentioned 
uh, starting from the preoperative consideration where they say actually i have mentioned it look for the movement of the neck look for the movements of the shoulder and once uh, position then you have to look for all the peripheral nerve which are liable to be injured and they may especially mention the keeping the arm abducted but not more than 90 degrees and proper padding and also uh, too much stress on the break uh, stretch on the brachial plexus especially created by you know abnormal positioning of the uh, the upper limb and also too much turning of the head and also the shoulder braces they have specially mentioned because we tend to use shoulder braces quite often but in that uh, asa database they say the shoulder braces can be a problem so what they suggest is as i already mentioned you can go for a non slippery bed and make sure that it is uh, they say if possible avoid shoulder brace and if you are very much particular in uh, using it you can uh, place in such a way that this is compressing only on the acromion not on the soft tissue if it is so what happens is when the patient is sliding down it will be giving an opposite pressure opposite push so that it can compress the brachial plexus yes, sir i also happen to see a very interesting checklist they okay. said that you go for a b c d e okay okay make sure that the airway is in position your okay. breathing that is ventilation okay. auscultate okay. okay. then circulation you see your monitoring lines everything is right then comes the disability like your eyes the neurovascular okay. things and then all those cables the exposure of the patient is proper so i thought that was very interesting ah, this a b c so it looked very nice just wanted to throw light on that sir thank you So what about uh, this one question in the chat box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More salivation in prone positioning. Anything to take care of before extubation. So one method is you can prevent salivation. So you can use anti-salivogs like glycoperlite, which can effectively reduce salivation. But still, it can happen. So a thorough suction. That is only option. You do a thorough suction. because always anticipate this i i wrote anticipate everything so thorough section and then you can extubate and uh, and the problem salivation is it can even cause loosening of the you know the plaster which we used to restrain the endotracheal tube especially when the patient's head is placed in a little uh, tilted position so always make sure that that uh, plaster uh, the, is uh, not loosened because there is one problem with salivation so better you give an anti saliva and also uh, one more thing i wanted to add actually uh, like what we used to do is like uh, we used to put a pack like a throat pack it, uh, just to absorb the uh, salivation so that uh, the plasters it will not get soiled and uh, it will not be the, it will not be loosened okay okay Thank you, sir, for showing all those pictures. It was nice. It was very really informative. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody has a question, they can unmute and ask themselves. Doctor Babraj will be is available with us live. So, any comments from senior faculty? Doctor Mubarak is here. Yeah, yeah. Just I, I just logged in only. I couldn't attend the Babraj talk. Uh, anyhow, congrats, Babraj. Babraj is coming as professor to Trichur Medical College. When are you joining? Are you coming, Babraj? ഒരാഴ്ച <laughs> 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 Suvarna from Kodikot, Kerikot. If anybody wants to ask any questions, they can unmute yourself and. Uh... But I think everyone, everything is very clear. So. <laughs> over to paul and babraj speak uh, every, everybody will be clear so lucidly he explains things he is explaining it very simply 
Yeah, yeah. So that you know, all everybody could understand it easily. That is the main advantage with the Baraj Babra's classes. That's why every day he is taking classes. Babra, thank you, thank you ma'am. <laughs> Very happy that you are coming to the shoot. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm the most happiest person. I think so because I just live uh, love to that place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, that's the time to say the vote of thanks and thank you all for attending uh, today's meeting. Thank you, the speakers, uh, Dr. Baburaj uh, and the two postgraduates and the moderator. And also the uh, the coordinators for conducting this meeting, and uh, above all, my president, Dr. Samsad Begum, for being very lively in this meeting. Thank you, thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.